Well, an emergency has a way of focusing the mind and establishing priorities. So if a fire breaks out in a home, the, the uh, inhabitants of that home will set aside their squabbling and they will get together to address this, uh, this emergency. Or if a uh, foreign nation invades, well, the lawmakers of that nation are going to set aside their internecine squabbling, they're going to set aside their legislative agendas and priorities, and together they will address this uh, emergency. Christianity is grounded in what its earliest proponents called good news, euangelion. Christianity is not a generic philosophy, it's not a bland spirituality. It's the proclamation of something new, fresh, startling, and urgent. Namely, that a carpenter from Nazareth, who declared himself the Son of God, is risen from the dead. And this is why there is, as I've often said, a grab-you-by-the-lapels quality about the New Testament. The authors of the New Testament are not engaging in generic uh, spiritual meditation. They are here to tell you about something urgently new. There's an emergency, if you want. God has become one of us. He's been raised from the dead. Therefore, he is the Lord. He is the king. And your lives have to be rearranged around this urgent fact. That's Christianity. It seems to me that Pope Francis has this evangelical urgency in his bones. And it provides the leitmotif of this new um, apostolic exhortation called Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. He knows that Christianity is about an emergency. But now, if you want a sort of positive emergency, this thing that is so extraordinary that's happened, and the whole world needs to know about it. Pope Francis knows that if Catholicism leads with its doctrines, as important as those are, but if it leads with its doctrines, it can devolve pretty rapidly into an intellectual debating society. Or if it leads with its moral teachings, it can devolve rather rapidly into a sort of finger-wagging Puritanism. What it leads with is the joy of the proclamation of the resurrection, this joyful and exuberant expression of the good news. Now I'm going to look at my page here because I want to quote directly from the encyclical. He draws our attention to the numerous passages that refer to joy in the New Testament. For example, when the angel greets Mary at the Annunciation, rejoice is his first word to her. Mary herself in the Magnificat, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. As a summation of his ministry and his teaching, Jesus says, I've said these things to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear, wherever the disciples went, there was great joy. The Pope, I love this, concludes with this wonderfully understated rhetorical question. Why should we not also enter into this great stream of joy? Well, why not indeed? See, there's the, the theme, the leitmotif of this letter, the joy of the gospel, the joy of this urgent uh, proclamation. The bottom line is the church fundamentally is a communion of missionary disciples, disciples of the Lord who have now been sent on mission. Now, if that's paramount, being a missionary disciple, then everything else will fall into place in reference to that central point. See, that's the key, I think, to this whole letter. As the Pope acknowledges and celebrates all the different dimensions of the church's life, he realizes what comes first is the joy of being a missionary disciple. Then everything else will fall into place. So, for example, Pope Francis loves the liturgy. You can't be a, a priest for whatever it is, 50 years, and not love the liturgy. However, if being a missionary disciple is the primary point of reference, then, and I'll quote, an ostentatious preoccupation with the liturgy becomes problematic. Pope Francis is a Jesuit. He obviously loves the life of the mind. He loves doctrines. However, if evangelical proclamation is the center of the church, a narcissistic and authoritarian doctrinal fussiness must be eliminated. Pope Francis, you see in all these interviews and, and letters of his, is a man of deep culture. You know, the references to operas and to novels and so on and so forth. 
However, if being a missionary disciple is the central preoccupation of the church, then the church cannot devolve into a museum piece. You might say an excessive preoccupation with uh, objet d'art and with the cultural heritage of the church. He's prioritizing, he's ordering, he's setting things right in reference to this primary um, purpose of the church. If there's one thing that bugs Pope Francis, and in light of what I've been saying, you can see why. If there's one thing that bugs him, it's ecclesial bickering. The fact that we Catholics are so often at war with ourselves. Now, you see it all over the place. He sees it. Uh, someone on the, on the strong left wing of the church might say, look, here's the right way to understand things. Here are the right doctrines. Here's the right emphasis. And if you're part of my little group, great. If you're not, I'm going to call you out and I'm going to spend a lot of energy bickering with you. The same is true on the extreme right. Uh, here's the right way to see doctrine and dogma. Here are the right points of view. If you're with me, terrific. If you're not, I'm going to fight with you. Again, if there's an emergency, we have a tendency to put aside our uh, bickering and together face the emergency. Here's the positive emergency of the good news. It drives the Pope crazy. And you can see, you can hear it in his rhetoric. It drives him crazy that given this urgent good news, we spend so much of our time and energy debating and bickering and quarreling with ourselves. Let's get together and present a joyful and unified vision to the world because the church is meant to be a sign of contradiction. The church is meant to be a community that stands over and against the uh, uh, bickering and, and quarrelsome world. But so often we become just an echo of the world, and that undermines our evangelical uh, effectiveness. A, a, a classical principle the Pope references a number of times in this lengthy uh, exhortation is bonum difficivum sui. That means the good is diffusive of itself. It's an ancient principle. It's a good principle. The good, by its nature, tends not to turn inward, but to turn outward. If you're in a good mood, you tend not to turn inward, but rather you, you effervesce, you, you bubble over, you want to share. If you've seen a good movie, you've watched a great play, you've met a great person, you don't want to keep that to yourself. You tend to want to share that with the world. The best news possible is that the Son of God died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's the best news possible. The first Christians were seized by this supreme bonum, this supreme good, and it became, therefore, diffusive of itself, which is why Paul can say, Woe to me if I do not evangelize. It was like a fire in the belly. It was like a fire in his bones. He had to evangelize. That's what Pope Francis wants us to recover, the sense of the urgency of the good, the urgency of the message of the euangelion, the good news, which will then make us missionary disciples. We will see the life of the church now in its proper order around this great center. I think that's what this letter is all about.